Hi friends, welcome everyone to another Advancing Eco Agriculture webinar. We really appreciate all of you joining us and learning together. We enjoy sharing the things that we've learned in the field. Our topic for today's webinar is thinking about biology as the key to crop nutrition. And this has become more of an established concept over the last five or six years, particularly in the regenerative agricultural world. The idea that biology can deliver 100% of a crop's nutritional requirements, um, not just nitrogen, not just phosphorus, but also calcium, magnesium, uh, zinc, manganese, copper, boron, and so forth. And of course, there's exceptions to every rule uh, that are dependent on geological context. And this is a topic that's been discussed quite at length from a theoretical perspective, but what is often missing is how do we make it real? And particularly in this moment in history with very high fertilizer prices, the common question that's coming up today is, can we inoculate microbial inoculants this spring and expect to see an observable nutrient absorption response? So I'm really excited to have David Miller here with us today. Uh, David has been consulting and working with the AEA products now for over a decade, and he's one of the stars that many of you have gotten to hear from and learn from over the last uh, year or more in particular. And uh, David is going to be talking about what he has learned and what he has observed working with these biological products. So I'm also going to be here in the background uh, responding to questions, and at the end, David and I will both be here for the Q&A. So thank you for being here. I'm sure you'll find the information useful and uh, welcome David. Thank you, John. What a great day to be talking agriculture again and to consider the importance of food. You know, a lot of times you might get into the tractor, maybe you're um, in the combine and you don't really think about the effect or impact that your occupation um, has on the world, on the human population. And I'd like to just take a moment here this morning to thank all of our, our farming friends, all of you who are producing food for the effort that you put in to feed your fellow humans, to feed the animals, to feed um, those who, who consume what you produce. And I find it remarkable. And, and I, I think um, there's a disconnect between the way the population in general sees farmers and how we ought to see them. So I just want to give a shout out to all of you growers that in my mind, in my heart, you are more important than all the doctors and the hospitals combined because you, by the quality of the food that you produce, have a greater impact on the health of humans. You can keep people from getting sick because food is more nutrient dense. Food is higher in proteins, higher in um, all the different medicinal compounds that help us to be healthy and well. So a shout out to all of you. And, and this webinar is just to keep encouraging you and all of us as we continue to learn new and exciting things about soil, about soil and crop relationships, about the, the microbiome. And it's, it's amazing. You know, as John noted that I've been doing this for 10 years. It was 2008 when I first started realizing or when I first understood that, that the nutrient density, the concentration of minerals and vitamins, the, the medicinal value of food was declining. And in that first year or two, I read like five or six books and thought I pretty much understood all of what there is to know. And to today, 2022... I'm excited that there is so much more to learn. So let's be student of nature. Let's be a student of how things were created and the pattern with which 
things are designed to work. And the closer we can function within that pattern, the more successful we'll be. So hopefully you'll find this, this little talk stimulating. And I look forward to the Q&A at the end where um, we can discuss the things that you have questions about. So we're going to look at context. We're going to look at why biology is better investment for you than fertilizer. We're going to look at how microbes are critical to improve soil health. We're going to look at the most economical ways to get your crops off to an optimal start. And then we'll cover some in insights and experiences from regenerative growers, people who have been and are on this journey. And then we'll have a Q&A session at the end. So let's start with context. You have soil or dirt. Are you working with, with soil that has structure? Are you working with, you know, what is this brown material that you're driving your tractor over, that you're putting your seeds in, that you're applying your fertilizer to? What is it? Is it soil or is it dirt? This is a, this is a picture that I got this, this, this week of a good friend of mine and his farm is on the right side of the fence. His neighbor's farm obviously is losing either soil or dirt. And I'm of the persuasion that if it were soil, it wouldn't move like this. And if you'll notice, there's a cover crop uh, on, on the right side of the fence and that's stopping and slowing down that soil. So soil or dirt, what, what are you working with? When we, when we are looking at any aspect of life for that matter, but especially when we're, when we're talking about producing food, about a bit that needs to be profitable, also that has a significant impact on the environment and on our fellow humans, it's important to think about the context with, within each operation, but also a context of the macro, looking at what's happened in the past, what has brought us to where we are, what is going to get us where we want to go, how, how far, when you think about your operation, how often do you think about 10 years from now? How often do you think about next season and two seasons ahead? Are we, are we thinking in that mindset? And so this is just a bit of context from, from history and also things that we need to think about. So the era of antibiotics for the soil is, is kind of the era that I would say we're coming out of where we've applied lots and lots and lots of materials that are going to act as antimicrobials, antibiotics. And whenever I take an antibiotic, I'm always very concerned about what it's going to do for my beneficial gut microbiome. So what about the soil? And what's the context in which your soil finds itself today in this era of antimicrobial products that have been applied to the soil? We need to think about the context of tillage and carbon. How does tillage affect the carbon in our soil, the organic matter in our soil. And there's, there's people who say, no, never till. And if you can make that work, that's probably the ideal. But a little bit of tillage here and there is not going to break the farm if it's in context. And if you're thinking about what's happening to the carbon, you're resupplying that carbon, you're getting a plant back into the soil as soon as possible. What happens with fertilizer and carbon? When we apply soluble nutrition, especially nitrogen, how does that affect the carbon? And what has been happening? What's the context of where we are today? How does carbon affect photosynthesis? Is carbon important for photosynthesis? Yes. And so if we have depleted lost carbon or if our carbon cycle is not in, symbi in, in symbiosis with the plant and we have carbon released at a time when we don't have the plant to take it up through photosynthesis, how does that affect five years, 10 years down the road? The context of photosynthesis, symbiosis, structure, soil structure especially, <clears throat> and its effect on the water cycle, as we can see in this video, 
I don't know what your thoughts are on this, but as I look at this, I don't think that we're going to capture very much rain if we have soil that's got infiltration like this. It's hard as a brick. It's the same soil that you saw in the beginning of the first video. It's just a block. And that's where the corn's growing in. But there's no room for biology, so it's very limited. It's, it's the gas exchange, the, the water cycle. All of these things are affected. So what's the context that you find your farm in today? And then we're going to go to the next point of why microbes are so valuable. Many crops, the genetic potential, the yield potential, I should say, is determined very early on based on the level of nutrient uptake. And, and the plant is reading its environment and determining what effort or what size of plant or how much how many ears or how much grain or how much fruit it's going to be able to set based on that early stage environment. So having a good biological root colonization really has a significant impact on those early stages, on those very early critical points of influence, but then also later in the season as your roots grow out, you will have better nutrient absorption because you have a better biological community working in symbiotic relationship with the plants. I'm going to give you two different examples of why microbes are a better investment <clears throat> and are so valuable in your soil. So on this soil sample, this is just a regular ammonium acetate extraction from Midwest Labs. And if you see this red circle, you can see that we have 81 parts per million of potassium, 49 of magnesium, and 939 of calcium. Now this is a very light sandy soil. If we look at our manganese, you can see we have three parts per million, which is very low. That should be like 20 parts per million. So that must probably mean we need to apply a lot of minerals in order for this to be um, become available. If we look at, or in, in, order, in order for us to have enough for the crop. Now, if we have a look at the saturated paste report, we can see that our calcium is only 19 parts per million. If you remember, we had 939 parts per million. Our magnesium, or I'm sorry, our manganese, which was very low at three, is non-detect at 0 0.02. So what we're seeing here is we're seeing a spectrum of nutrient availability. So on the scale of which nutrient or the, the availability of the nutrients to the plant, you can see that we have way less than what we have in our soil analysis. However, if we look at the total mineral extraction and, and we look at all the nutrients that are available out there, we have double the amount of calcium that we had in our regular soil sample. So instead of 939 parts per million, we have 1,873 parts per million, meaning we have a lot of calcium out there. We have, and again, we have the saturated paste at 19. The manganese on the total report is 23. And we had three on the regular ammonium acetate extraction and 0 0.02 on the saturated paste report. So here you're seeing the spectrum from not available at all, where we have a total, and you could think of this, if you were, if you were to use the analogy of finances, you could think of this as your assets, the total nutrient report as your assets, and then your ammonium acetate extraction as your savings account and what's available in the, in the saturated paste analysis as your checking account or your cash. And so there's a lot of nutrients out there. And if we only look at the ammonium acetate extraction and we try to balance the soil based on that, we're really making decisions based on a very limited perspective and really not in context of all of the other factors on our farm. I'm going to give you another example 
of a soil in Nebraska. And if you look at this purple square, you'll see the P1 and the P2, which is two different phosphorus extractions. You're going to see here that they're recommending to put on 100 pounds of P2O5, which would be roughly 200 pounds of MAP. And now we're going to look at the total nutrient digestion. So if you can remember here, we're low on phosphorus and we're just gonna focus on phosphorus for this specific scenario. We're recommending phosphorus. And now we look at the total nutrient digestion. This is taking all of the nutrients in consideration. And we have 811 pounds per acre of phosphorus out there, which would equate to 400 per million. That's equivalent of 3,574 pounds of 11520. So if you have 3,500 pounds, a ton and a half of map, what's the value of that? And how much value will there be in applying another 200 pounds of map when you already have 800 pounds out there, but based on your regular soil sample, it was just showing as deficient? And I'm just going to point out, because we're going to touch on nitrogen later in the conversation here, in this sample we have, in this soil, we have a nitrogen value of 2,800 pounds per acre, which is the equivalent of three ton of urea. And so why are microbes so powerful? It's because they are what make these nutrients available. If we just try to balance the soil by looking at the, the ammonium acetate extraction, and I will say that a lot of soil analysis today aren't even adequate. If they just have NPK and they don't have calcium, they don't have magnesium, they're not even what I would really consider a soil analysis. They're more like a fertilizer selling analysis to just get you to buy some phosphorus and some potassium and hydrogen. But plants grow on a lot more than that. However, if you are doing a full spectrum analysis and let's say, let's say your calcium magnesium ratio is out of whack, or let's say you need more potassium or you need more phosphorus, if you don't have biology, and I want to just put a caveat in here or a disclaimer that I don't want anybody to get the idea that we never have to put out soil amendments. There are times when it makes sense to put out a couple hundred pounds of gypsum or to you know, to put out some raw phosphate or to put out potassium, especially in very light sandy soils. So don't take this to say that you never have to put out a soil amendment, but to balance your soil by just putting out more fertilizer slash soil amendments is kind of just like putting more ground up rock on the soil. And I did this uh, a time or two. And the one time, especially I remember, we put out like 2,000 pounds of, of rock phosphate, so 23, or uh, it had 23% phosphorus, like the total phosphorus was around 23%. And we did another soil analysis and it came back at the very same part per million. It didn't move it one bit because there wasn't biology. And this was in very early on before I understood the plant and the microbial symbiotic relationship that we understand now. On the other hand, if we put on a foliar to help the crop and we don't have the biology in that root zone, we can get a crop response from the foliar by providing it for a very limited time with the nutrition that it needs. But as it enhances the photosynthesis, as that foliar enhances the photosynthesis and more sugars go down through the roots, if there's no biology there, then that's where the cycle stops. If the biology is there, then you have that cycle repeating itself and you actually get a very, the, the response from the foliar is more of a trigger. And that trigger allows you to take up way more nutrients, your plant to take up more nutrients. And thereby you get a significant crop response from that foliar, not because of the amount of nutrients that were put out, but because of the trigger and how that accelerated the microbial 
rhizosphere and, and, and the whole microbiome. What about soul borne diseases? It's really just about good guys versus bad guys. If you have a good microbial inoculation, meaning if you have a good symbiotic relationship between the root and the soil, if there's a sheath around the root, like, it, like you have on this onion, how will the bad guys get in there? So the protection, and if we create an environment where these good guys, meaning beneficial bacteria and fungi, are able to give the plant all that it needs, and the plant is able to give them all that they need, there's no place for the bad guys. So establishing a functioning microbial plant symbiotic relationship really is the key to success. Because healthy plants can be 100% resistant to insects and diseases, says John Kemp, and I believe that. And healthy, I like to think of healthy as when all of the parts are functioning. So you can look at a healthy, you can look at a plant, maybe like this plant back here, and you can say, well, it's green. Is it healthy? Not if the biology is not functioning. You can look at the root and say, is it healthy? Everything looks nice. But if the top part, the photosynthetic part isn't functioning, then it's not a healthy plant. So a healthy plant is when all of the parts are functioning as they should be. So let's just take a look at this cascade that I was talking about with the foliar application. If we put on a foliar application that's providing the plant with whatever it's deficient in and sap analysis is the best tool that we have today to identify which nutrients are excessive and which are deficient and to put out the least amount of material to trigger that plant to full capacity photosynthesis. When we do that, then we enhance an increased level of sugar production. So it looks like this. When the sun shines on the leaf, you have the photonic energy reacting with the chloroplasts and glucose is formed. So if the sun doesn't shine, then photosynthesis stops. Do you all agree with that? What if there's no water? There's not enough water. H2O and CO2 are the two primary building blocks that are react it to build that glucose. So within that chlorophyll, you have the, the water, the H up and the CO absorbed by the leaf and the sun shines on it. The reaction happens. The plant releases oxygen, which is why it always feels so good when you're in a forest and you have all that just refreshing air. It's because there's lots of oxygen there. So if there's not enough water, that reaction can happen and photosynthesis is slowed down. If you don't have the minerals that are needed in this photosynthetic process, which the five, the, there's a lot, really the plant needs all of the essential nutrients in a greater or a lesser degree in this whole cycle, but five of the elements are really key for the photosynthetic process. Magnesium at the center of the chlorophyll molecule, nitrogen as a part of that molecule, iron putting it together, manganese splits the water molecule, in that photosynthetic process. And phosphorus in the form of adenosine triphosphate is needed to transfer that energy and keep the Krebs cycle going. So we need all of the minerals, we need the water and we need the sunlight and we need CO2. We need this carbon to be acted upon by the biology, be released into the atmosphere, be absorbed by the leaves and then to be converted into sugars and be put back down through the roots. And when that happens, <clears throat> the bacteria will be digesting that carbon, those carbohydrates as they come down into the roots, which means the more the, the bacteria are digesting, the, the, the more food source they have, the more bacteria you will have. And when those bacteria are reproducing and growing, they will use minerals from the soil to to build their bacterial and fungal bodies and 
in return for the carbohydrates, the plant will, will get those minerals. So when the plant has more minerals, it will take it to another level of photosynthesis and plant health. Because, and this is a really key point in this, this section right here, microbial metabolite nutrition is when the plant takes those minerals in the form of my, microbial bodies or um, microbial poop for a lack, I mean, that's just the English term for microbial metabolites is the fancy word for it. When the plant takes it up in that form, it will use eight to 12 less times the energy as when it takes it up in simple ion form, such as your soluble nitrogen, soluble phosphorus, and so forth. So when you have eight to 12 times more energy, what's the plant going to do with that energy? It's not going to be eight to 12 times bigger. What it does is it now has the energy to store, to build and to store fats and lipids and plant secondary metabolites, these compounds that will, will be active um, repellents for insects. And, and there will be an active immunity that the plant is building up when it has the energy to build these plant secondary metabolites and these, these higher compounds. And so when we get to this level and we have higher levels of plant secondary metabolites or think of them as fats, now those start being pushed out through the roots into the soil at greater volume. And when this happens, the fungi will digest that. Bacteria doesn't digest the fats and oils, which is why meat is preserved in fat. And because bacteria isn't able to, to break the fat down and, and digest it. So the fungal digestion of, of those higher energy compounds is now going to build stable humic substance. And that's how we can rebuild the soil simply by putting on one application or providing the plant with the nutrients that it needs in the proper balance. So how might this look on your farm starting from the beginning to the end? What's, what's a good way to be implementing this? And this is a quick outline of, of how we look at it. Make sure you have biological inoculation. You can use um, various inoculations. We'll talk about those later, the biocode gold. Don't put on more soluble fertilizers than you have to. And if, if your farm, if you're transitioning or if, if you're reducing nitrogen because of, of the cost, whatever it may be, always think about the context. What is this nitrogen in this amount at this time going to do for my plant? What's it going to do for my biology? What's it going to do for my plant microbe symbiotic relationship? And think about the context and how that's going to affect the rest of the season. Think about how that's going to affect that biological cascade and how much humus you will be putting into the soil as compared to if your plants are depending on the microbial system and are able by the microbial system to take up the majority or all of their nutritional needs. So we're just going to go through this in a little bit more detail to give you some context of how practically to apply this in your operation. And one of the one of the context points that that I think I glossed over was the connectivity of the caregiver or the caretaker. How connected are you to the soil? How connected are you to your plants? How connected are you to what's happening? Not just in a in a mechanical business sense, but really, you know, smelling the soil, really getting in there, digging, looking at the roots, looking at soil structure, understanding what's happening, looking for limiting factors. That is really, you know, all of these things we're going to talk about, you as the caretaker, the one who's stewarding this land is actually the most important component. So you can put a lot of these things into place and still fail if, you aren't out there observing. And part of the reason that that may happen is because you're not thinking five years down the road and you're not thinking 20 years 
or 100 years back and thinking about the context of where you are today. So I encourage you to be connected from the aspect that you can be applying materials and products and, and all of those things are helpful and in your context, in some contexts, they're more helpful than other contexts. Depending where you are, maybe you have cattle and maybe you have a very good rotational grazing and, and you really just need a little bit to tweak that system. Or maybe you're on the other side of the spectrum and you're growing very intense vegetable production or fruit production and it's a long ways from the, the pattern of nature. It's a long ways from all of that and you have to supplement that system much more heavily. So let's look at the regenerative soil primer. And we talked about the importance of inoculating or of having a good symbiotic relationship of plant to the microbe. And establishing that is, is key. The best place to establish it is at planting or before planting so that when your seed germinates, the biology is right there and that symbiotic relationship is happening from day one. And it looks like that little onion plant that hadn't even germinated yet, but the root portion was completely covered with biology. As you'll see on the next slide with this wheat, spring wheat that's not germinated. And see the roots and see how just totally covered that is with biology. You could shake that off and that, that rhizosphere sheath would not fall off. That's soil aggregates that are glued by bacteria byproducts called glomalin. The, the bacteria and the fungi are just sticking all of those things together into a beautiful structure. And the plant's able to absorb that uh, in the form of microbial metabolites. Let me just back up one slide here and talk for a second about the rejuvenate spectrum are a a combination of products that give you a very diversified biological inoculant that includes nitrogen fixers, includes phosphorus solubilizers, includes um, the, the uh, Zootomonas florens species, which are very affected by glyphosate applications. So there's, there's a whole suite of biology in, in this spectrum. And we have various different spectrum products for specific use cases. The Sea Shield and the Rejuvenate are simply food, energy, and tools for the biology until it gets established with, with the plant. So it's, it's a delivery system, a starter system that feeds and supports the biology until it gets established um, on crop residue or preferably on a plant. And this question comes up quite frequently is, well, can I just create my own biology? And the answer is absolutely. If you have the infrastructure, if you have the manpower, if you have the interest, you can create some really amazing compost, manure, compost tea. There's, there's, there's people who are taking virgin soils and, and bringing in biology. I think all the things are great, but what we've found is that, and, and I don't know how many growers, I probably couldn't list them on both hands, that used to be building their compost tea. And when they learned about Spectrum, when they learned about Micro 5000 and PZ1000, they stopped using it because they have a consistent form that's easy to use and is in a very stable form. So it doesn't, doesn't, isn't going bad like the compost tea will. So Yes, absolutely. If, you're, if you have the infrastructure and the interest and you're able to build a consistent product, go for it. More power to you. But um, if not, then the Rejuvenate Sea Shield and, and the Spectrum are a well-proven out system that has given us very consistent results in, in establishing that symbiotic relationship with plants as well as crop residue digestion which is what actually the, the whole system was originally created for. There was a lot of, of concern a number of years ago about genetically modified crops, especially those that were rootworm tolerant and 
and corn earworm tolerant, they weren't breaking down. And so people were having two, three, four years of crop residue. And so this was the original design for this microbial inoculation package. And then we saw so significant changes in soil structure. People, people <laughs> actually, we, uh, we had a consultant who would get his growers to spray half the field. And then he wouldn't tell the consultant which, which side he had sprayed. And the consultant would walk across the field. And the majority of the time, he was able to pick out which, which site had the, the soil primer applied just simply by the softness of the soil. He could feel it when he walked. So with that, we realized how effective it was in, in establishing biology in the soil. And then later we started applying it a lot also in, in the row starters and getting it out there right with the plant. So it's a very multifunctional package that will really work well in establishing on your farm. Biocode Gold is another very key. It's, it's the most economical or effective as far as return on investment goes of any microbial inoculant I have worked with. It's just, it's, it's a combination of mycorrhizal fungi. It's got a little bit of bacteria. It's got some very unique and interesting food sources in there that just work. I, <laughs> that's about all I can say. I mean, we have, I have one example of, on here of spending $4 for the biocode gold and getting an 18 bushel increase in, in conventional corn. It's, it's very simple. We've seen significant improvement in germination rate and just consistency of germination. So treat your seeds like gold, treat them with biocode gold. And then I'd like to talk about nitrogen for a second. How many of you feel that nitrogen is very important for the success of your operation? And what you're looking at here is a chart of <clears throat> the nitrogen cost in the last 13 years from 2008 to 2021. And so you can see it went up, it was up, it dropped, went back up in around 2012 and then dropped way down in 2017, 18, 19. And now in 2021, it's just, you all know the story. So I don't need to, I don't need to spend a lot of time on that, but this is what I like to point out. And, and this is the reason I asked the question, is nitrogen critical for your success? And when, when you say it is, then I'm going to ask you, what is success? Because this is a graph, and I'd like to just point out to you that this is also from 2008 to 2022. Do you see any similarities in the trends? We're looking at corn prices now. So it looks to me like 2012 to 2011 to 2013 would have been the time to grow corn. This, that was the all-time high, and... It was the, the nitrogen was also high, but not as high as it is today. So maybe corn prices will keep rising to match that, which is exactly the point. Is success profitability? Is profitability success? And if, if the nitrogen prices and the corn prices have such a similar trend, how does that make you feel as a grower? You might say, well, I don't, I don't have any control over that. I, I, don't, I can't do anything about it. But the reality is you actually can. And I'd encourage you to do that. One of the things you can do is to make the nitrogen more efficient. You can stabilize it. You can add things to the nitrogen to help stabilize it in a way that's not going to be antagonistic to your biology and will actually help to convert it into a microbial form of protein that is very stable, that'll keep it from leaching, that'll keep it from volatilizing and losing it through, through um, gassing off. You can also use alternative sources of, of nitrogen, such as compost, manure, compost tea, fish hydrolysis like Sea Shield, or plant-based proteins that are amino acid form, um, often coming from soy or from food waste. And those are all great alternatives that I would really encourage you to be looking at. But this is what you is the nitrogen cycle. See, the, the gas, this 
stuff that we can't see that keeps us alive. We call it, you know, the air, the oxygen, you know, we get oxygen, but really that atmospheric gas is 78%, not phosphorus, not potassium, not oxygen, but nitrogen. So how is it that we are so influenced when nitrogen is such a critical component of our success and yet profitability is what true success is. And yet our profitability looks like it's, you're never going to win the game from 2008 to 2022. The trends are right there. Corn prices go up and you think you'll make more money, but then the nitrogen prices comes and what's the problem? So I would encourage you to really think about how can you take advantage of the nitrogen cycle and the things that you need to think about are soil structure so that you have good gas exchange. If, if the soil isn't breathing, and yes, the earth, the soil actually does breathe. Have you ever noticed the, in the evening, the fog goes down or the air comes down and it's cooler? It's because the air, the gas is being exchanged in the soil. It's breathing. And when that happens, if you have good soil structure, the bacteria and your plants will actually be taking advantage of that atmospheric nitrogen. I mean, think about... Think about the forests. Think about the prairie. There was never a nitrogen deficiency there. And why is that? So think about nitrogen or think about good gas exchange and think about nitrogen fixing bacteria. Think about plants that you can, that you can plant that will have a symbiotic relationship with certain nitrogen fixers. That can help a lot in fixing nitrogen. But then again, even if you have legumes in your mix and you don't have good gas exchange, if you don't have good soil structure, it really won't help. You, you won't take advantage of that nitrogen cycle. Think about it. You can take control of it. The profitability, the, the, the whole game, you don't need to play it. So... The nitrogen efficiency program, I, if, if you've listened to John at all, um, you, you've heard of this before, of adding humocarp, which is the non-denatured form of humic acids, meaning we don't extract it with, with potassium hydroxide or with sulfuric acid or any acid, but rather it's mechanically processed to a, in, in a way that you get the humic acid, the fulvic acid, and the human fraction, the actual rock, if you will. And so... It's a very strong, powerful <clears throat> stabilizer or um, material to complex the nitrogen. So think of it in that. Actually, I remember years ago, John, you you told me how you know think of it as as being these S hooks, or you could think of those little toy monkeys we used to play with, and they all held hands and you hooked them together. And in each of those little crevices, you can have a nitrogen. So think of, of this humocarb as a very porous material that complexes the nitrogen and keeps it in a stable form. That's one aspect of the nitrogen efficiency program. It keeps it from leaching. It keeps it there in a stable form. So it doesn't, it isn't as easily converted to a more nitrate and nitrite and then oxidized back into the atmosphere. See, nitrogen is a cycle. Nitrogen is not a stable thing that you're going to build up. It's a cycle. And it's about you maximizing and capitalizing on that cycle. The other part of the nitrogen efficiency program is to enhance and empower the microbial digestion of the nitrogen that you're putting out. So adding some rejuvenate again as a food source, making sure you have a 10 to 1 nitrogen to sulfur ratio because it's very for building, converting these nitrogen molecules into protein form, which then is more stable and will be utilized microbially, meaning it's more efficient for the plant to utilize as an energy source. And lipnose is very important and is, is largely deficient across many of the soils we work with. So if you haven't been applying molybdenum, you want to be sure to apply molybdenum with your nitrogen because it's a critical enzyme cofactor for the nitrate reductase enzyme. And if you don't have that, then the, the plant can take nitrate, but it just gets stuck in the leaf. And soluble nitrates is an attractant for insects. It makes the plant more susceptible to diseases. So the goal is to convert those nitrates into proteins and keep them in those protein forms. So you've got humocarb, 
rejuvenate and then making an amylyptinum and then making sure you have sulfur, which many people use ammonium thiosulfate um, as, as a way to, to give that mix. And we're happy to look at what nitrogen source you're using and get you an exact and specific recipe. What this allows you to do is actually reduce your nitrogen inputs without reducing your yields. And I would encourage you that as you do this, you know, start with 25, 30% in that first year. And if, if possible, if, if you have the ability to apply your nitrogen throughout the season, then you're set to go. Start out with putting out a small amount of nitrogen, use the nitrogen efficiency program with it. And then based on SAP analysis, you can add another 20 pounds, another 40 pounds, another 20 pounds as you go through the season. And many growers who are able to do it in that way, do it very safely, keep their yield goals, uh, keep hitting their yield goals and reducing their, their nitrogen by as much as 50%. And I've had, I've had people who just said, I'll just, you know, I'm, I'm going to cut it way back. And, you know, we're able to cut it back by 70%. But again, you have to have the context. If you've been applying soluble nitrogen for the last 50 years, and now you suddenly reduce it by 50%, and you don't have that biological um, symbiosis going on, you don't have the biology for soil structure, you don't have the gas exchange, then you could be shooting yourself in the foot. So, Again, context, 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 and apply your scenario. And if in question, just call the 800 number and our consultants will be happy to help you. So I'm just going to run real quick through a couple of the growers that we've been working with that are delighted with seeing in their crops and what it's doing in affecting them when they don't have to be working with as many insecticides, fungicides, and not losing as much sleep at night because we're not as concerned about Texas root rot taking all of our cotton out. We're not as concerned about the ligus bug coming and chewing everything up because last season we were able to put on a foliar application, that triggered the plant, that allowed it to build the compounds that it needed to effectively resist the ligus bug. So this is, this is cotton in New Mexico, amazing yield increases. It's too long to get into, but if you're growing cotton, call us. We, we really are excited about the things that we have seen in cotton by managing vegetative and reproductive energies with nutrition, on a much tighter scale and not having the, the plant growth regulator shutting the plants down. And if you go to New Mexico, I believe it was New Mexico State that did a study showing that the plant growth regulators not only stunt the plant, but it actually shuts it down. Like there's, there's no photosynthetic, photosynthetic energy happening at that point. There's no, there's, there's no um, carbohydrates going down through the roots. It's just gonna shut down and it's that stress that gets it to put on a tremendous amount of bowls, which is okay. But one of the complaints we had in the beginning was we, if we only had a month longer growing time, and this was, this is, this is right, this is right on that line where, you know, another month would have really made a difference. Well, when we looked at it, he was putting on five growth regulator applications. And if, if each of those growth regulator applications was in effect shutting the plant down for six days, like this research, was there you go. You can finish out the bowls. And there's so much more details that we could talk about on that. Dan McClure from Walla Walla Organics, um, just what he's seeing on his soil and also the kale. He, he grows kale for baby food and we were able to help him meet the, the goals of not having the excessive nitrate so that you could actually sell it for baby food. Just lots of, lots of excitement when the soil structure starts changing and you don't have to fully depend on that nitrogen cycle or on that pesticide cycle. Everybody else is worried about aphids and you're, you're not worried about that. You're going to be 
watchful. It's not that, you know, your plants still have to be at a level of health that they can resist that. So you got to be watchful. You can't just take it for granted, but it's very possible to get there. Oh, wow. Look at this one. On the left, you have a control field. On the right, you have with soil primer. My understanding here is same irrigation cycle, same, same variety of cotton, same planting date, just with the soil primer and without. And so you just have what? I would suspect it's more nutrient availability because you have more biology and the plants are able to take up their nutrients in the form of microbial metabolites. Another one. Is there a difference in those two pictures? The only difference is biology or no biology. Could you do with this with compost tea? Quite possibly. But if you don't have the infrastructure, you don't have to build the infrastructure to get started. You have a good, solid, proven system that you can apply and start getting results. Like this one. Which of those do you think is going to be more drought tolerant? This is wheat. And this is just across the road from each other. So same variety, very similar plant date, simply with biology and without biology. So who is AEA and who are we talking about? This is a snapshot of our team, which um, really we need to take another one because I'm looking at this and there's probably 10 people that aren't on here, maybe 15. I don't know. It's time for a new Probably 20 <laughs> might be. So the point is that it's not just John and I. There was a day when it was just John and I, but it's not just John and I. You have a whole team of people across the United States from Florida to California to the Pacific Northwest. And in the Midwest, we have a scattering of consultants and consultant teams and warehouses that are able to serve you in whatever capacity that fits in your content, in your operation to help you be more profitable. And we work with commercial growers, as you saw in, in those testimonials. We work with mid-sized growers. We work with growers who are interested in the next 10 years. Growers who care about the future. Growers who care about the people that eat their food. Growers who care about the next generation and growers who care about profitability and making their farm successful. Those are the people that we love to work with. And if you're here listening and you're not working with us, come on, let's go. With that, we're ready for questions. So, John, I will let you uh, moderate that. And I'll just pop this up. If any of you don't have our 800 number, the 800 number that's the customer care team and they will they will take your information your region the crops you're growing and they will direct you the best consultant on our team you can also email us and have the same response or the same thing happen sign up for our newsletter to make sure you are being notified of all the great things that are up and coming or that we're doing and if you haven't listened to the podcast I'm here to inform you you've been missing out, but they're still all there. So listen away. I think there's probably close to 100 by now, and they're just loaded with information. So don't miss out. If you're not signed up on these, on these um, newsletters and podcasts and webinars, help yourself. There's a lot of information that John has put out for your advantage, and, and I would uh, encourage you to use it. Go ahead, John. Thank you, David. That was an excellent presentation and there's lots of compliments in the chat uh, and the Q&A for you. So thank you for that awesome overview. There's an, also a lot of really good questions. So thank you to our audience for that. Um, I'm going to begin with one question that was incorrectly put in the chat just so that I don't lose sight of it. And the question is, with good soil structure and especially with and following your nitrogen efficiency program, what percentage of a crop's nitrogen needs can be met? For example, grain corn. Well, I have experience of 100% of the nitrogen being, like I said, 
context that needs to be considered. What is your carbon level? What is your sulfur level? What is your level of biology? What is your gas exchange? But yes, it's possible. It really is. And John, you were on that farm. They, that year, they ended up having a really, really dry year, a drought. And so the yields weren't as spectacular as what it looked early in the season. But you were there just pre-tassel and there was zero nitrogen. It was just this soil primer program and the starter um, solution. And you can attest to this, John, there was, there was yeah. no yellow leaves. I mean, as in no, like those leaves were still on those plants. I was, I was there again about four weeks after that period that you and I were there together, David. And at that point, it was post-tassel. We were starting grain fill. And um, yeah, this was slow with zero nitrogen application and leaves dark green all the way to the ground. It was very impressive. And that was, that was I think, perhaps the first time that we saw it to that degree. And that was, what, three or four years ago? To the mm -hmm. point now, as we've learned more about how to manage and manage it, this is, this is not an uncommon experience. So... David's answer is right. It is context dependent and you have to understand what your soil is capable of, but it is possible to, it's possible on most agricultural soils to deliver 50 to 70% of a crop's nitrogen requirement. And it's possible on about 20 to 30% of agricultural soils to deliver 100%. And this brings us to a question from Jerry Snyder. Is there a way to measure the soluble nutrients added to the soil by a biology? Um, so by soluble, I assume that question is referring to available. Yeah, let's call it plant available. Yes, and and the answer is yes. The the Haney analysis does a a very good job of giving us a good idea of the nutrients that are in that biological form. So yes. And we see that very consistently with the before and after Haney analysis. You know, if, if there's a baseline Haney analysis, sometimes we've seen it as soon as a year. Sometimes it takes two or three years, depending on the crops you're growing and the diversity and, and again, context. But I've, I don't know that I've, I've, I've seen any before and afters where the biology didn't increase those levels of available nutrients. There's a question here from Jared Lake. When planting potatoes, other than applying some gypsum in the planting hole and using BioCoat Cold, is there anything else I should be applying to the potato or to the in the furrow? And Jared, the answer is most definitely yes. There's lots of other stuff you can do. And if you want to dig uh, into that, I would suggest going to the Advancing EcoAg website and looking for our crop programs. So we have a couple of template outlines, uh, including one specifically for potatoes. Um, question from Jeremy, is plant sap analysis still very expensive? Are there any US labs doing the analysis and does that make the testing any less expensive? Jeremy, sap analysis has always been cheap. Cheap, and I tell you cheap. I'm sorry, Jeremy, but um, it, when you look at the price per set and you compare it to maybe a tissue sample, yeah, maybe it's maybe it's a bit more expensive than that. But when you compare it to the inputs that it saves you, and yeah, it it's John said it well. It's cheap. But to Follow your question, to, go sorry, ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, um, there are a couple labs in the US. There's, um, we are still using the Nova labs and the labs here are not, not necessarily all that much faster and they're not less expensive. So the cost per set is still same. Yeah. And, um, Every, every year or two, we run robustness tests and compare all the various labs and their consistency of reporting. Follow-up question from Jeremy. I have lots of plant residue from last year, like sunflower stalks, straw, etc., along with cover crop residue. I'm wanting to break it down more rapidly in spring. Should I use biodigester or the soil primer mix or add it to the soil primer mix? The latter. Yeah, I would suggest adding biodigester to the soil primer mix. 
perhaps in place of spectrum or in combination with spectrum? Yeah, yeah you might reduce the spectrum rate just a little bit. I'd still keep spectrum in there because it does have some phosphor solubilizers. It does have some nitrogen fixtures um, at a higher concentration than the biodigester and probably even some that the biodigester doesn't have. Yes, I would, I would add it to the, uh, or the, to the uh, soil primer mix. There's a question here from Kurt that uh, hits a number of my triggers. A uh, question from Kurt is, I was recently told using a new product that uses root-associated diazotrophs to fix nitrogen for broadacre corner cereals is pointless because that little bit of biology won't survive to do its job. Is soil structure and health going to be the overriding factor to their success? Does that go for BioCoat Gold as well? Kurt, the answer is that doesn't go for BioCoat Gold, and it also doesn't go for the diazotrophs that you are mentioning. Um, it might in some situations if soil has been really uh, compromised with quote-unquote antibiotics such as anhydrous ammonia and glyphosate and a bunch of uh, materials that really shut down biology. But in general, this is an argument that is frequently made by folks who have negative things to say about soil biology, and it's just flat out not true. It's just flat out not true. I, I frequently get this comment that, well, how can you expect, if you have biology, if you have a soil that contains millions or billions of bacteria per teaspoon, how can you expect to put a few ounces or gallons of product and put on this tiny amount of bacteria into the field and expect it to successfully establish a population and actually do anything? As if though somehow that were a crazy hypothesis. And I just have a very simple question. Have you ever heard of rhizobium? Like we put a single species of bacteria on a clover seed or on a bean seed and we expect it to establish and establish nodules and create a successful population and produce a nitrogen response on a legume crop. That's a single species. It's become common accepted practice because we know it works. And the same is true of many of these other species of bacteria that are not present in soils that can be inoculated very successfully. So. Um, it's a straw man argument that is not held up by the evidence in my experience. And I'll get off my soapbox now. I would just add to that, John, that, that if you don't have gas exchange, you can put on as much biology as you want. And you're, you're going to have less of a response than if you have gas exchange, but that biology will eventually change the soil structure. The biology is the key to changing the soil structure. I had someone tell me here a while back that they, they just provide the house for the biology by balancing the soil. They apply gypsum to have a better calcium to magnesium ratio and that provides a home for the biology. Meaning that just having the right soil balance gives you soil structure and it's, that's not the case. The biology, you have to have the biology to create the soil structure. Yep. Thank you, David. That's an important clarific clarification. So follow-up question that ties into this from Charlie. If you are starting with BioCoat Gold, would you recommend reducing or eliminating the in application of 624-6 to stimulate symbiotic relationships? I missed the first part of that, John. If you are starting with BioCoat Gold, would you recommend reducing or eliminating the in application of 624-6 to stimulate symbiotic relationships? Yes. Yes. If you, I would, again, it's, it's context dependent. So I want to be careful because this can be, you know, this is a very general yes, but in short, most of the time, uh, if, if you can eliminate it, you should, meaning <laughs> it's, it's, um, you know, it's a big deal. If you've been growing a successful crop and you've been using this 624 six, and now you, you want me to eliminate it. And if you have concerns about it, fail safe, you know, do a small enough area that's safe to fail. But if it were my farm, I wouldn't put 626 in the row. Never. 
Never. And I wouldn't put it in the two by two either. Because if you put out 624.6, the amount of phosphorus that you get from that as compared to what you get from putting those dollars into biology is next to nothing. That, that phosphorus will tie up with your available calcium. And now you have less available calcium in your soil and calcium is needed for cell division, which John talks about a lot, especially concerning fruit. But what about your roots? What about cell division in your roots? And if you just put on the 624.6 and you tie up all the available calcium and make tricalcium phosphate again, you don't have the phosphorus. And I'm talking, you know, in the span of three days to three weeks, depending again on, on the level of calcium and phosphorus you have. So I would not put 624.6 on my farm. I, I agree with David. Uh, we actually, years ago, did extensive experimentation to evaluate what are the nutrients that applied at planting, when applied at plant, planting, actually establish and develop large, vigorous root systems. And uh, surprise of surprises, we, we actually, we never published this. We repeated it six different times just because I didn't believe the results. But um, phosphorus applications actually produced a smaller root system in the long term. In the short term, they produce a nice flush, but in the long term, they actually had a negative effect on the development of root system structure because of this flush response of having a temporary nitrogen phosphorus supply and then a long term a phosphorus deficiency because of the impact that it has on soil biology. Um, so, unless you have a known documented improvement, you know, here's another aspect to the question that David is answering is that many times. Uh, we apply these starter fertilizer materials and we don't actually know that they produce a positive response. It's just we've always done it. And if mainstream fertilizers were held to the same standard of accountability as biologicals, most of them would fail because there are many of them that do not deliver a crop response, but it's just what everyone does. So of course you would do it. It's quite remarkable actually. Uh, David, another question here. When is the optimal timing of the Haney analysis for nitrogen reading for the current crop year? Good question. I'm going to say it's going to depend if you are able to apply nitrogen through the, you know, during the season. If you're in a dry land environment where you can't apply nitrogen later in the season, then as late as you can before you're planting. You want that soil to warm up, you want the biology to be working, you want that nitrogen cycle to start happening. <clears throat> if you are able to apply during the season, um, I would, actually actually thinking about or talking, talking that through, I would still do it as late as you can before planting on the Haney analysis, but then really the SAP analysis is is what you really need to be looking at because the Haney analysis tells you what's available, but just because it's available doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be taken up by the plant. In other words, just because it's on your plate doesn't mean you're going to eat it. And if you don't believe me, you probably don't have any children that you're trying to feed broccoli. <laughs> yep. A follow-up question. I've been told that stabilizing nitrogen fertilizer with carbon sources, such as humic sources, will make the nitrogen unavailable to the crop and is thus not recommended. However, my understanding is that stabilized N will remain in the system, not leach, and will be cycled through microbes and eventually become plant available. Assuming my understanding is correct, can I expect a delay in plant availability of stabilized N? and that this delay may require an adjustment to my end fertilizer program. Yes. Yes. By adding the carbon source, you're, you're taking away that flush of soluble carbon, or I'm sorry, soluble nitrogen. So you don't have that excessive volume of, of soluble nitrogen early on. And later as the plant as the plant reaches out and, and ideally you're not putting the nitrogen right to your roots because the plant takes up that nitrogen and 
the roots tend to not go out as much. The other thing that's <clears throat> that I think is very important to think about is the nitrogen carbon cycle and how when you apply soluble nitrogen, you will oxidize carbon at a faster rate. And so make sure that you, when you apply nitrogen or the, the ideal scenario is that when you apply nitrogen, you have a crop there that's photosynthesized, photosynthesizing efficiently and you're able to take advantage of that flush of carbon. Yeah, so I would like to clarify uh, what you just described, David, because I think there might be a slight uh, discrepancy or misalignment here. Um, so the, the perception is that humix will make nitrogen unavailable to the crop and is thus not recommended. And uh, what David is describing is that the addition of humic substances in our experience will make it such that you do not have this flush of nitrogen immediately after application for let's say a three day to a week period. You don't get this tremendous spike. However, the nitrogen with the combination of humic substances is still available to the plant, but on a delayed release. So that release uh, will occur over a three to four week window rather than a flush all at one shot. Um, so we do in fact put in humic substances to our nitrogen applications all the time, highly recommended and wouldn't consider doing it without it. So. The idea that it would not be recommended is uh, the exact opposite of the way that we would manage humic substances. All right, I think uh, we will take time for one more question. There's a number of questions here that we haven't responded to yet that we'll have to follow up on. Um, there is there's a, many excellent ones here to choose from. Um, there's one here from Joe. I'm growing in fine sand and my reported silicon levels are low. Obviously there's a ton of silicon in the parent material. Can biology work to solubilize silicon from parent material as large as sand? And I see David nodding yes and my answer to that would be definitely yes. You need particularly fungi, you need mycorrhizal fungi and other fun uh, fungus to accomplish that. Uh, bacteria will also help. The form of silicon that plants absorb is in the form of monosilicic acid. And uh, in our sap analysis, to some, there's variation, of course, from crop to crop and the symbiotic relationships that they have. But to some degree, you can use uh, silicon content on a sap analysis as an analog indicator for biological activity. So the answer is yes, you definitely can have biology release silicon in sandy material in yeah. sandy soils. John, there's, there's one other question here from Rodman Lott that um, I was actually toying of putting into this presentation and um, didn't, didn't fit into, it didn't fit it into the presentation, but could have fit in with the nitrogen stabilization. The question is, have you had any experience with vomitoxin in corn? And I'm reminded of where we ran a trial this was a number of years ago already. And the interesting thing that we saw, this was, so this was one quart in five gallons of 1034 per put in furrow. And there was a three leaf difference just before harvest or as the corn was ripening, um, there was three leaves lower that weren't fired. So there was a lot more nitrogen available later, just like, uh, just like you described. But then the interesting thing is I took the, the corn from the treated and the control, put it into plastic bags and set on my desk with the intention of sending it off to the lab. And before I could do it, I had some mold sprouting on the one that wasn't treated, but the one that, that had the humocarb in it wasn't molding. And it, it eventually did, but it was, way longer and it was a different kind of mold so just it seems like whatever you know the stabilization effect the biology there was definitely a difference between the two um in the toxin level there in in, in that corn so that's actually something i like to repeat again yeah fungal fungal sense. development and uh, the development of vomit toxins and aflatoxins on grain um, is directly connected to the nutritional profiles of that grain, the protein profiles, the nitrogen profiles. 
and the way that uh, the plant manages or, or the form of nitrogen that's in the plant and throughout the grain uh, has the potential to greatly reduce or even completely eliminate the development of uh, molds and mycotoxins on grain. Wonderful. Well, to all of our listeners, thank you for being here. Thank you for sticking with us over the hour. We really appreciate all of you, and uh, we hope you find the information valuable and useful, and we look forward to having you join us again in our next webinar. Have an awesome day and happy growing. Thank you, David. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you, John. Be well.